Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being with us here tonight. We are with Senior Matters and they will take us to a virtual workshop on container gardening. So you can learn everything you want to learn on that. Before we begin, I do have to share my screen for a moment just to go over some of our functions. Uh, let me share my screen. Oh, uh, I'm going to have to stop, stop your screen. Yeah. Just for a minute. So we are hosting our session through Zoom webinar. There's a couple of options for communication. We do have a chat box. It's on the right side of your screen. If you have any comments, if you need any help with any technical issues, please post them on the chat. If you have any questions, about the presentation about container gardening or a question for our panelists or presenters, please post that on the Q&A. You'll find the Q&A at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom menu. The last thing today is we are simultaneously translating this into Spanish in a separate channel. If you look at your Zoom options on the bottom right, you will see a gridded globe icon Go ahead and press that and make sure you are in the correct channel you want to be in. You can choose either to be in English or in Spanish. If you get any interference, please make sure you can mute the original audio. Again, if you have any questions with any of the functions on our Zoom webinar, please contact me through the chat. I will be keeping an eye on it. And with that, I can go ahead and hand the meeting over to Sue. Thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, I'm Sue Zislis. I'm the program chair for Senior Matters, and we are abundantly grateful for the collaboration with uh, Garfield County Libraries and, and Alex, who has helped the Senior Matters group uh, bring seniors who were stay at home like everybody else, uh, trying to keep in touch with the community. And this is currently the last in a series of Zooms. Um, we will they will be on hiatus for a while and try some in-person things this summer. I encourage you to look at the website valleyseniormatters.org to see what's going on in person this summer. And uh, uh, just two things that I would mention is we're going to have a uh, sip and paint party uh, where for $25 fundraiser at the door, you can have a glass of wine, some snacks, uh, some art instruction, and a take-home project. And the other thing is we're doing open house at Senior Matters uh, every Monday afternoon. And you can get more information about that on our website. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to introduce Jennifer Vosser, who is a um, Garfield County Master Gardener herself. And she will be the moderator for this presentation. And um, we hope you enjoy. Jennifer? Thank you, Sue. Yes, yeah, so we are going to be asking questions in the Q&A on the bottom in your scroll bar. And we will be answering questions intermittently during the panels. And if there is a really pertinent question to a slide, I will stop Deb Martin, who is our presenter today, and let you let her know what the question is. So please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll be answering them throughout the presentation. And I wanna introduce um, Deb Martin. She is a lifeline garden who has gardened in Garfield County for 18 years. She's been a Colorado master gardener for 28 years, currently with the Garfield County Extension. She grows vegetables, herbs, fruits, flowers, trees, native plants, and a small amount of turf or grass. Debbie's favorite object is garden to table, as she is also a master food safety advisor. In addition to volunteering with the county extension, she also volunteers with Garfield County Senior Program, and she teaches Tai Chi and assists with teaching cooking matter classes. So feel free to ask questions as we go along the container garden presentation. Enjoy. 
And here is Deb. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Jennifer and Sue and Alex. And thank you to all of you for attending today. And do please feel free to ask questions along the way. So my screen quit working. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> no. How that work? No. Um, so why would we use containers? Lots of different reasons you might want to use containers. You just might want to do it. You might want something indoors. Um, you might have lousy soil if you're trying to improve. And in the meantime, you want to grow in a container. Maybe you just think they're pretty. You could have limited space and you need to keep things contained in that space. So you can grow vertically as you see, and you may or may not be able to see my cursor, but over here, um, they're growing things vertically versus horizontally, whatever works. Make the most of the space you have. Uh, poor soil. Lots of times people are in an area where there's been construction or other reasons that the soil is no longer particularly good. You're trying to build it up, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you've decided just to go ahead and grow um, in a container. A design preference. You just think they're pretty and you want to use containers. You can do creative combinations, conventional and unconventional plants. Things that unconventional would be things that would not normally grow here, like the orchids you're seeing there. Questions on why up to there? Anything, Jennifer? I can't hear you, you're muted. Oh. There, there are no questions right now. Okay, um, that's okay. Another reason is for accessibility. As we get older, we sometimes can't bend over anymore. Um, it becomes more difficult and you might want to have things up higher. You might just want a teaching garden, which is also easier if it's up higher, or uh, you have just a balcony. So lots of different reasons that you might want to, or a patio that you might want to grow in containers. Portability. There's lots of things we like to grow that we can move, that can't stay out here in the winter, won't winter over. So this way you can put it in a container, move it out in the summer, and then move it back in in the winter. Um, plant requirements. You might wanna grow blueberries. We have alkaline soil and Blueberries like acidic soil. If you put them in a container, they'll do real well. If you just put them in the ground, you might have problems. You might want to put herbs in the kitchen where, so they're right there. You don't have to go someplace to get them. They're right there in the kitchen with you and grow the most common ones you want. Um, you might want to grow them for health reasons indoors. You might want to just brighten something up and you think the herbs, I find herbs pretty regardless of where they are, so. The first thing you really want to do is think about a plan, but it's not, doesn't have to be a huge written down plan, but you need to think about what do you wanna grow? Where do you wanna grow it? When do you wanna grow it? And how are you going to take care of it? We'll go into each of these a little bit more in the next few slides. We're going to talk first about a container. If you're growing something that is very large and has a massive root system like a tree, you're going to need a larger container like over in here. If you're growing succulents, you can put them in a shoe, like you see over here. So depending on what you want to grow will depend on what type of container you want. You can pick the container first. You can pick what you're growing and suit it to the container. So it's not a huge decision, but it is a decision that needs to be made. 
you want to make sure that the plants you choose can grow in the container that you have it in. So we have the soil level over here, soil level, and it is below the top of the pot or the container that you're growing in. You don't wanna put the soil all the way to the top because that would just make a mess. So you have it down a little bit. You need to make sure that your pot is big enough for the things you're growing in it. As you see in the middle picture, the plant outgrew the area it was in. Most plants, uh, most flowering plant flowers take four to six inches to grow. Trees are gonna take much more than that, unless you want to do bonsai. And then that's gonna take a lot of effort and you probably want to read up on bonsai or take a uh, class on it. You also want to think about the heat tolerance of your plant. A darker container is going to get hotter than a light colored container. The size restrictions, I think we talked about that. And then the maintenance of the container. If you want the container to last more than one year, there will be some maintenance on it. If nothing else, just washing it off, making sure it's clean. Selecting what you want your plants to grow in, the planting medium. You need to know what your plants require. So do they need, more? how much moisture do they need? They're all going to need uniform drainage and they're all going to need air. Believe it or not, we all know that plants take air out of the atmosphere, but they also get air through the roots and that needs to take place. So, you need to have uh, whatever you're planting them in has to have air pockets in it. There are soilless mediums such as coconut fiber, sphagnum, vermiculite, different kinds. And then there are potting soils and potting soils will always need some amendments added to them. Most of the soilless mediums will also because our water is alkaline so, and most plants prefer slightly acidic. So as you're watering, you're making, you're draining out nutrients and you're making your soil more alkaline. So you'll need some type of amendment or fertilizer food for your plants. Questions? We do not have any questions right now. Okay, so. Garden soil, it's cheap. I can go right outside and get it. However, our garden soils, most of them are very heavy because they're clay based and they easily compact. So we have no air in them and they have pests and pathogens in them. So those will be transmitted to your plants. So you may or may not want to grow in native soils if you, in a pot. If you choose to do so, add some type of organic matter to it. And before you do that, you can kill all the pests and pathogens by putting them in a, putting your soil in a pan in the oven at 350 degrees for 30 minutes. And um, Deb, we do have a question. Sure. So on the previous screen, were the plants too close together? That's this one. Uh, if they're asking if the if the paper whites are too close together, they are not. Uh, they, I'm okay. sorry. They, yes, they are. So clarify again. If they're referring to the paper whites, which are the white flowers on the right, on my right on the screen, those are planted too close to each other. They should all be at the same height. They shouldn't be at varying heights. 
if they were different types of bulbs, they could be at different levels and that would be fine. Did that confuse the issue? Um, Suzanne, did that answer your question? I think so. Okay. So basically, if they were all at the same, if all the bulbs in that picture were at the same height, it would be too crowded. But if they're ones, bulbs that grow at different levels, then they are not overcrowded. And we also have another question from Laura on what do you recommend adding to lower the soil pH? In a container here, you basically cannot do that, no matter what you add, because you're going to water with our water, which is alkaline. So you'll just waste your money. You'll undo what you did. So what to answer your actual question, peat is what you would add. Peat moss, because it's very acidic. But as you water, it's going to turn it back to alkaline. So adding the peat is good for organic matter, but you need to keep adding other, uh, adding things that make it acidic. And that would be another layer of peat. So do you like, do you recommend people using like, a lot of us have used miracle Grow, and we mix it into our watering can and then apply it? Sure. Okay. Great. That get it? Oops, let me go back. Think we were here? So yes, um, miracle Grow, any of those things. And we'll get to watering and fertilizing in just a minute, which we'll also get a little more into that. Thank you. Thank you to whoever asked. So preparing your container. Plants need drainage if they're in a pot. In the ground, they just automatically have drainage. But in a pot, they don't. So you either need to drill a hole in the bottom of the container or add a layer at the bottom of the container to take up any excess water you might put in there. So an option is to, I, you've got a beautiful pot and you don't want to make holes in the bottom. But it's tall enough to put a couple inches of styrofoam ugh, or rocks, pebbles, marbles. That can be your drainage system. And then you just don't overwater. Roots don't like to sit in water unless you're growing hydroponically. And that's a whole other subject. <laughs> Incorporate organic matter. That's what we always need. It's almost always the answer to half the questions is, why, you're, why is it failing? There's not enough organic matter. So that's always a good thing. Fertilizer. If you can start out with some time released and then fertilize also along the way, your plants will be more successful. If you do decide to make your own from soil, you know, dirt out in the yard, make sure you add a third of that dirt, a third of something like peat moss, and a third of compost. And that'll usually get you through the season if you fertilize in addition to that. Make sure you don't overfill the pot. You need about a half inch to an inch at the top of the pot where there's nothing um, no soil, to, then that just helps for um, hygiene is basically what that's for. Make sure that the plants fit in the container you're putting them in. So, and that they won't outgrow it 
too quickly. You don't want to have to repot five or six times over the summer. You might repot over seasons because it's something you're keeping year round and so your lemon tree grew, but you want to try to keep it so that you don't have to be repotting on a real, on too, too often. Um, too often being after you've got it in the in past the baby stage and in a container, you probably don't want to have to repot more than every six months. The older the plant, once a year would be kind of almost a maximum. Make sure that the pot can hold the root system of the plant. So that gets back to flowers have a small root system, a tree would have a larger root system. So you'd need to have a pot big enough to handle the root system of the tree. Questions on choosing a container or planting? No. Oh, here's a question. Sure. I have large ceramic pots. I use plastic milk containers and other plastic containers to decrease the need for soil and to make the pots lighter. Any problem with this? And this is that's an Mary. excellent, excellent, excellent way to do that. Yes, that's a good thing. Anytime you have a pot that you just want, but it would take too much soil, that's an excellent thing to do. Uh, anything that you know, it's basically non-toxic to go in the bottom. What you don't want to do is if the plant needs the entire pot for its root system, then you need soil down there. But from the way you worded the question, yes, that's a very good thing to do. Anything else? Um, there is a question from Marjorie. Any advice about whether the pot is too big? You can grow something in too big a pot. You don't want to grow it in too small of a pot. So there's really not an issue with it being too big. However, having said that, a small plant will grow slower in a big pot than if it's in a smaller one. Quite often they develop the root system first and then they put the above ground growth on. So they might grow a little bit slower, but that would be the only consequence. Wouldn't kill them. There is another question. I was gonna mention one of the things that's available here is pine cones. And I know you had a picture of pine cones, but they're nice to fill the bottom of the pot also. Yes. So we have a new question from Mario. Is ceramic better than plastic pots? Ceramic or terracotta, like you see at the bottom here, or plastic or wood, like we see over here. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Terracotta sucks water out. So you have to keep the terracotta pots. You might have to water them more often. Um, plastic pots hold water really well. So you need to make sure you've got really good drainage. And then depending on the color of the pot, it might heat up. So a black pot would heat up more than a white pot. And you don't want to fry the roots. Um, Ceramic. Ceramic pots can also, because they're usually in pretty colors, can also end up getting extra heat. Uh, the, probably one of the biggest problems with ceramic is if you want to leave it out in the winter, it will crack unless it is glazed both inside and outside. But otherwise, any of those work perfectly fine. There's really not a preference of one over the other. It's really more being aware. Plastic pots do have an advantage as they are lighter than most any other kind. And so if you're going to be moving the pots around, it's nice to have a lighter pot. Did that answer the question? I think so. 
Um, we also have another question from Mario. Can you mm -hmm. give us a quick and easy way to compost buckets or small trash cans? How do you know when it's ready? Composting. Mm -hmm. um, you can compost in a container or just sitting out on the ground. As long as you just have a pile of things. You're not going to make compost really quickly here because it doesn't get hot enough, long enough. If we didn't cool off at night, the compost would cook faster. But since the compost, um, since we cool off at night, the compost cools off at night. So you can use compost starters, you can use the uh, chemicals that uh, boost it you're not going to see a huge effect from that. When is it ready? You can use it whenever you're ready to use it. It's actually considered compost when it is degraded. So when it starts to look like dirt and doesn't have a lot of um, whatever you put in in the first place recognizable. Did that help? And also, if you go to Garfield County Extension Office through CSU, there, if you go into the looking for topics, there is a fact sheet on composting that's very detailed. So you would go to Garfield County Extension Office through CSU, and then you would hit, I think it's under resources. They have one or two fact sheets about composting in there that are very informative. Yes. And one of the least expensive ways to make a compost bin is to get um, pallets, wooden pallets that haven't been treated. You can usually pick those up for free various places and make yourself a three-sided bin. You leave out the fourth so you can actually get in there. And you put all of your new stuff on one side and you turn it to the other side back and forth. And, and with the end, we'll have a few more, um, uh, more information, but thank you, Jennifer, on the CSU websites and where you might go to get further info on most any gardening topic. And, and just one other comment in, like when I start out, I start out with a plastic container in my house that's sealed and then I carry it outside. And when you have your compost in a container outside, when I'm looking at buckets or trash cans, you have to be able to have the air go through. So like using a pallet, there's space where there's air. So if you're totally contained in a trash can or a bucket, your compost isn't getting that air through it or draining the water. So think about that with what you're using for composting. Yeah. And then another compost tip, please do not put meat or dairy products in your compost. That attracts animals. Otherwise, your compost should not really be attracting anything other than maybe birds picking up insects that are in there. Maybe skunks might come get the insects too, but it'll be in insectivores, not the bears. And if you're attracting bears to your compost, you probably have something wrong with the way it's creating, breaking down. And that needs to be adjusted generally by either don't put in what the things you shouldn't have, meat and dairy products. Um, the other tip is uh, all of your veggie waste from the house is wonderful. As long as you did not put cooked vegetables that you have seasoned or salted. A lot of the seasonings have salts in them and salt itself, of course, our has salt. Um, our soils are, have a lot of salts to begin with. And so you don't wanna add extra salt. Anything else? No, I think we'll move on. Okay, so when you're watering, we talked about drainage. We talked about how you want your 
potting medium to be able to have some air in there. Watering frequency, that depends on the plant. However, too, uh, more often is not good. You only want to water the plant when it needs water and you want to water it deeply. So if the very top of your soil has dried out, that does not necessarily mean you need to water. Stick your finger in to about your first knuckle. If that much is dry, you probably want to give it a little drink. But if you can, you'd like to water once or twice a week. Having said that, we live in a very dry area. And when we get the really dry, hot days, often you're going to need to, in a container, to water every single day if things are outside. So it's simply a matter of actually going out and checking your plants and seeing if they need water. Just make sure that your soil isn't always wet. You don't want it wet, you want it damp. And then it depends on what the plant itself needs. Um, some plants are very high water. Some plants like uh, succulents are very low water. So some want their soil to completely dry out and some want it to always be damp. So you just have to read the labels on whatever it is that you're putting in the container and what those requirements are. Or you can go to our website or Google it and see what those the uh, watering needs are of that specific plant and then try to match that. Fertilizing. When you first plant, it's nice to put on a soluble, water soluble fertilizer that is slow release. Some people don't like the appearance. Some people just don't like the idea of they put a chemical in there. So if you don't want to do that, you're going to fertilize probably with compost tea and you're going to want to fertilize every time you water. I'm sorry, that's not right. Once a week, you want to fertilize. Weekly, weekly is what we call it. So you want to, with a weak fertilizer, water once per week. So if you're using something like miracle Grow, instead of mixing it the way they say, mix it by one third of that and then water once a week with that and you'll be able to keep up with the, fertile, the needs of a plant in containers. Questions? No questions right now. Where are you gonna grow it? You need to look at the plant you're gonna grow and determine what kind of lighting it needs. And that's what you need to give it. So if it's inside, it's going to be more difficult than probably than it is outside. But don't try to grow a shade plant in the full sun and don't try to grow full sun plants in the shade because you're not going to be very successful and you're going to beat up on yourself. And you, we don't want you beating up on yourself. We'd like you to be successful. Most of the plants on them will tell you what the uh, light requirements are. If you don't know, you can call the extension. We'll find out and let you know. Or often on our website, it'll have something about a particular plant and what its needs are. So you can research yourself or you can give us a call and we'll be happy to help you. If you're growing indoors, please think about any pets and or children that you might have that are of an age that they might eat the plant. There are some beautiful indoor plants that are highly toxic, both to people and or to pets. Sometimes it's just to the pets, not the people. Sometimes it's both. 
but we don't want anyone poisoning themselves. So if you're not sure, please call poison control. And there's the number for poison control. You can also go to the ASPCA or call them to see if it's poisonous to your animals, whatever animal you might have in the house. But we want to make sure that you aren't poisoning your you or your kids or your grandkids or your dog or your cat or your lizard, whatever you might have. Sanitation is very important. We don't want diseases to build up or pests to be in the container that you're planting in. So make sure you clean your plant, the planters, preferably at the end of the year, rather than waiting until the beginning of the season, because then at the beginning of the season, you don't have to do it. And it's so much easier. It's just out of the way and it, you don't have to worry about it. Deb, do you uh, also have, your, oh, I was just going to ask you, do you recommend like dishwasher or white vinegar? What do you recommend people clean their pots with? Um, basically just a mild soap and water. If you have a lot of buildup, like, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right here where this pot is on the right hand side, vinegar will get that off. A very mild bleach solution will kill any pests, but it's no more than 10%. Thank you, Jennifer. And Go there ahead. was just a comment from Nancy. Thanks for the possible toxicity to pets info. Please don't forget to mention that cut flowers from the garden can also be toxic. That's an excellent point. And thank you for bringing that up. Did everybody hear that? I think that you should be sure. There's, there can be plants outside that if your uh, pets can get to them, you might want to plant them someplace they can't, as well as if you are going to cut them off, flowers, et cetera, and bring them inside, your pets can get at those also. So really think about, and your children, what you, the toxicity of the plants and where you're going to have them. Thank you, that was excellent question or comment. We're ready to go on. Okay, so problems with container plants. We break them down into basically three categories. Cultural, i.e. you're not growing it the way it would like to be grown. Environmental, uh, you left it out all winter and it won't winter over here and pest problems. We'll go into each of those. Notice up at the top that overwatering and underwatering look the same. A lot of people, their plant is wilting and they say, oh, I need to water that. And you are actually over watering it. So always check, remember, stick your finger in at least to your first knuckle and make sure that plant needs water. Make sure that it's got good drainage, that it hasn't plugged the drain hole and it's not actually sitting in water. Um, you can have cultural problems because you didn't fertilize or you over fertilized. That's why we recommend that you fertilize with a weak fertilizer solution once a week. And then overcrowding plants, putting too many plants in one, and that's kind of the root system over here on the far right. That's just too much for the pot. The roots have actually cut off everything from each other. Both of, whoops, I'll go back. Both of the others are examples of overwatering, believe it or not. You would think that this would be drought stress, but it's actually overwatering. Environmental problems. You can introduce, if you especially, well, even with potting soil, you can introduce pathogens and or insects. 
unsuitable location. It likes morning sun and you gave it afternoon sun. Our afternoon suns are brutal on plants and you can have all kinds of problems with certain plants simply because they're getting afternoon and no morning sun. A lot of plants prefer morning sun and less in the evening. Um, and then just the climate, you left it out over the winter and it won't winter over here and you found that out. Um, a good example of that is rosemary. Rosemary, just because of our the way our seasons go, in the spring, we have, it's winter, it's summer, it's winter, it's summer. Rosemary doesn't like that. So it will be growing fine. All winter long, it will be alive outside and you're so proud of yourself until spring when it becomes summer and a few days and it starts growing and then it becomes winter and it kills the new growth and it actually ends up stressing the plant and killing the entire plant. So you have to think about all the different, but whether or not it can truly stand our winters, our climate. Questions? We have a question from Udell. When there are brown tips on the leaves, does that usually mean, oh, sorry. When there are brown tips on the leaves, does that usually mean overwatering? It doesn't usually mean anything. It can be overwatering, it can be underwatering, and it could be a disease. It's going to be one of those three. It's probably not an insect, but it could be. So kind of the insect would be the, the least. That wasn't a good answer, I know, but that is the answer. Well, and for overwatering, you know, you just have to feel your soil look at your saucer, see if there's a lot of water in it. You know, there Stick are water meter in there. Yeah, well, and there are water meters sometimes that you can purchase to test, but you'll have to investigate. Yeah. And there's no other questions. Okay. Pests, those darn pests. We have four main categories of taking care of pests, cultural, biological, mechanical, and chemical. Pests like plants that are under stress. So growing your plants so that they're healthy helps to keep the pests away and helps them survive any pests that there might be. However, there comes a time where you do need to take care of the pests. Cultural controls. Making sure that you got a hardy plant selection. That you didn't grow something that outdoors in the winter that didn't belong here. I guess that wouldn't get a pest, but. Um, inspect them. If you see that one of them has a whole lot of pests or an infestation, Remove it from the others if you can, so that you're not spreading the pest while you take care of that one. Fertilizing and watering regular, on a regular schedule really helps cut down on pests. And then checking whatever mulch you might be using. When you put on the fresh mulch, make sure that it doesn't already have something that you're introducing, either a pest or a disease. And we do have some questions, Deb. Sure. Um, Mario asks, is water from a water softener bad for plants? Yes, it has extra salts and the plants don't need that extra salt. So it would be, it's not going to, it will slowly affect them. Let me just put it that way. And it will affect them in a negative manner over time. And now? Unless you have RO water. Um, another but question. This, but, but yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, we have another question from Nancy. When choosing plants, please consider natives. And we say, yay, choose yes, natives. Yes, yes. They're a little bit hard to find around here in the nurseries, but do ask for them at your nursery and look for those natives. Yes, thank you. Jennifer and I are both working on um, a native plant series for plants that are native to Garfield County. And so maybe you'll be interested in that down the road once we get that done and are ready to give that presentation. And it's actually gonna be a series. And we have one other question from Laura. Any tips for combating Japanese beetles? Where are you? Laura, so where are you located? Where are you located? I have to wait for her. She yeah. is in zone 6A in Indiana. Welcome. Ah, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> Picking them off <laughs> is, is the method that you would use that is the least, is actually go and pick them off with by hand. Um, other, the next would be some type of, um, they're, they're up on the food chain. So chickens would eat them if you wanted to put chickens out with them. Otherwise, sadly, you're going to be stuck with a pesticide and contacting your local extension, county extension, and you do have them there in Indiana, if you will get with them, they would be able to tell you the best method for your area. The reason I asked is, is we don't have a big problem with them until you get to uh, silk rifle area. And before, uh, above there in altitude, it's met, they're usually manageable simply by just picking them off and killing them. I hope that helps. And that is the last of the questions for right now. Great. So okay. biological controls. Deb, we have one other question that just sure. came in. Go ahead. From, um, let me make it live. Frank asks, after bringing plants in from outside, I brought in gnats and then unable to get rid of them. How do we get rid of them? Sticky fly traps, and we'll get into that in just a minute. All right. Um, anything else? Nope, that's the only question. Okay. So biological controls, and you can use those biological controls indoors also. You can release ladybugs and or praying mantis indoors if you don't mind having them in your house. And they will take care of a lot of gnats and flies and aphids that you bring in accidentally when you bring in the plants. So Dad, um, if somebody wanted to bring in praying ant praying Nampas, sorry, Mantis, or ladybugs, yes. where would they purchase them at? Uh, good question. Most of the garden centers around here can get those for you. So that's where you would go is just to your favorite garden center. I doubt Lowe's or Walmart would have them, but um, a lot of the garden centers have them or, or can get them if they don't have them at that moment. But let's talk about that for a minute. Releasing ladybugs outdoors. They, the adults don't eat a lot of food. It's the babies, the, the immature stage, the larvae that like to eat tons and tons and tons of food. So you release ladybugs and they're gonna lay their eggs where there is food for their young. So they will lay eggs and then they will fly away and you need to wait for those eggs to hatch. So when you get ladybugs, they often go to your neighbors if you put them outside. So they're fun and they're entertaining, but you may not, may or may not see a huge effect. Indoors, they have no place to go, but it's your house, so they'll stick around. Praying mantis, tend to stick around more. They like to stay wherever it is they hatch. Generally, you get the praying mantis in 
um, larvae stage. And so they will hatch, well, being a cocoonish, and they'll, they will hatch and there you go. You've got them hatched. They'll come out of their cocoon. cocoon. I also um, brought in my plants this winter and um, I had those flying gnats. They, when you water the soil, they really become active. Yes. I did try potatoes, that did not work at all. Um, the only thing that worked for me with the gnats was to really let the soil dry out as much as you can yes. because it minimized the number of gnats. And um, I think this year when I do it, I probably am gonna change my soil before I bring them inside because they were and kind if, of annoying. Yeah. If that's a practical, that's what you do, yeah. And then the other thing, when I moved my plants outside that had the gnats, um, they were pretty healthy plants. So I, I did lose some plants, I think, to the gnats, but I also, I washed off the roots of my plants before I planted them outside in new soil to get rid of those gnats also. Yes. And then so, we have, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, there's another question. Yes. From uh, Mario, from Mario, is pellet fertilizer poisonous to the birds and insects? Good question. I don't know about the insects. I sincerely doubt it, but I do not know. Jennifer, can you make a note and we will find out and we'll get that answered. Yes. To the birds, the birds will not eat it. So it's not gonna be a problem with the birds. If it's in a container, let me clarify. They may be pecking around in the container, but they're not going to eat the um, fertilizer. So they'll be fine. Good question. All right, and we're ready to go on. Okay, so mechanical controls. We just talked about cultural or biological controls. Mechanical controls. Sticky fly traps, like over here. That works a lot for gnats, works really well. Trapping, which is trapping them. Hand picking them off. If they're large enough to see and you can just pick them off. If you are, watch your plants regularly, you can often get, when it's not a big problem, you can take care of it right away. Nip it in the bud, so to speak. Washing them off. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit in regards to aphids. But lots of times just washing off the plant is good enough. And then sometimes you just want to prune off whatever is diseased if it's a disease instead of a, an insect or a pest. Chemical controls. We prefer that you try other methods first. Otherwise, please read the label instructions and follow them as they were meant. Don't use a chemical for a pest that you don't have. Make sure the chemical is labeled for the pest that you're trying to kill. Remember that there is, if it kills pest A, it's going to kill beneficials also. So you're not killing just one, you're killing more than likely many different ones. The pesticide has signal words of danger, warning, and caution. Caution means it is harmful to you. It's just not as harmful as a warning or a danger. Chemical controls are considered to be herbicides, fungicides, or insecticides. Having said that, rubbing alcohol, which you really wouldn't want to drink, <laughs> can be used and is, would be on maybe the caution list. It could be harmful to you, but not in the way you're going to use it. So we'll go through some insects, white flies. Outdoors, you probably won't have a problem, much of a problem with white flies. If you do sticky traps or um, hosing them down, will pretty much take care of the problem. Indoors, it can be a problem. 
And one of your best solutions is taking them outside and hosing them down and or getting some praying mantis or ladybugs or other other insects that will eat them for you. Otherwise, mechanical control of go pick them off. Smash their eggs. And that's what they and their eggs look like. Eggs are on the underside of the leaves. So you need to start looking at the underside of the leaves. Spider mites. You know you have spider mites when you see this webbing. You may not even notice the mites themselves, but you'll notice their webbing. Um, they're difficult to control. Once you get them, you tend to get a large an infestation of them. Washing off the plants and increasing the humidity can help solve that problem. Taking them outside can also help reduce the problem because the mites have some place to go. Generally inside, you're getting mites because the humidity is too low indoors and increasing the humidity can really help with a mite uh, infestation. Crustaceans, isopods, and earwigs. What we think of as roly polies, and then we all know what earwigs are. Generally, they're causing very little plant damage. They just came along. They just hitched a ride. Earwigs, they really get a bum rap. Earwigs like to eat things that are decaying. So they are probably cleaning up after whoever it is that caused the damage, caused that damage that they caused, the dying from that. So earwigs are a sign that you might have a problem, but they are seldom the actual problem. But they will hitchhike their way in, and then when they run out of things to eat, they'll start eating the plant. <laughs> Keep your containers clean. Inspect your plants before you bring them in. Pick off anybody as soon as you see them indoors. That's kind of the easiest way to take care of those. Fungus gnats and springtails, we get both, indoors and outdoors. Generally, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, <coughs> they are overwatering. They're feeding on a, on a fungus that's in the soil. And so if you kill the fungus, which needs the extra humidity, the water, you will kill them. They're generally harmless to the plant. They're just a nuisance and they're, they make your plant look ugly. So cut back on watering for a little bit. See if you can't get the tops to, to dry out to kill them. Sticky traps are also an excellent way to get rid of them. They fly. Scale insects. You'll get those indoors. Picking them off as soon as you see them and or crushing them is a good way to get rid of them. Uh, you'll know that you have a whole lot of them if you start seeing a bunch of honeydew. That's what you think of that the um, aphids give off, although we're talking about scale insects. They seldom move around much, so they're fairly easy just to pick off. Difficult to control other than that, um, but you can scrape them off. Some of them, if you coat a Q-tip with alcohol, and put the alcohol on them, that will kill them because it dries them out. It breaks down their outer um, shell protection and then they dry out and they die. Aphids and mealybugs, they can be a problem. Aphids, an interesting thing on aphids. Aphids right now, so we're talking starting today. Aphids give birth. They give birth to adult aphids, fully grown aphids, live, who are pregnant. They are all female. In a few days, like about a week, those aphids are going to give birth to aphids that are all female and pregnant. 
A few weeks, a few days later, the same thing's going to happen all summer long. Unlike most insects, they just keep giving birth to females that are pregnant. At the end of the season, when it starts getting cool and the days start getting shorter, they will produce males. The males will mate with the females, the females will lay eggs. The eggs then will winter over. And then next spring, we will have aphids again when they come out and all of those aphids will start that cycle all over again of giving birth to females that are pregnant already. So you can see how the aphid population grows up really quickly. Aphids have to get on the plant to feed. They can't feed in the soil. And it's very easy to break their legs. And if you break one leg, they can't feed. They can't crawl, so they can't feed. So taking them outside and hosing down the plant is one of the most effective ways of getting rid of aphids. And Deb, Just, it is six o'clock and I was wondering if you could let everyone know um, how much longer is your presentation? Thank you. We're gonna go about another 10 minutes, including questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Sooty mold. Sooty mold is caused from the aphids, from the honeydew, any, any insect that produces honeydew. And it is harmless to the plant. It just looks ugly. And all you have to do is wipe it off, wash it off, and then manage the honeydew producers. So pest management, what do we want to do? Minimize, to minimize the pest problem, take proper care of the plant. Give it the light it needs, the fertilizing it needs, the watering it needs, not too much, not too little. Basically taking good cultural practice of your plants. If you're going to use a chemical, make sure you read and follow the product label directions carefully and follow them. Call us if you need to know what it is you need to do. We'll be happy to tell you. We would rather you call us and use something that we know will work as opposed to trying something that someone said they heard would work and actually harming the plant. And we would prefer that you use environmentally friendly control methods. And this is just a quick summation of what I said before. And I believe you're all gonna have access to this presentation. So I'm just gonna go on by it. But basically it's giving you um, alcohol for soft or scale type insects, sticky traps, aphids, just wash them off with a, a strong, vigorous jet of water. Spider mites include increased humidity, um, things that fly, sticky traps. Pesticides. If you choose to use a pesticide, remember that you're killing beneficial insects as well as whoever you meant to kill. Always read and follow the label directions. Resources from CSU. If you Google CSU Extension or Garfield County Extension, you'll get our website, but there it is. Uh, we have a plant database that will tell you whether plants are native or alien to Colorado. And if you Google Colorado plant database, you'll get it. It's out of Jefferson County. Plant Talk has a wonderful selection of just information on plants. You can always go to Ask an Expert. If you Google Ask an Expert, you'll get the website. And then please, Never hesitate to call the Garfield County Extension. Everybody have something to write on and with? The number is 970-625-3969. And you want extension two. 
and they'll either give you the answer, get you the answer, or match you up with a master gardener. Questions? Um, I was wanting to know, Deb, if you research about pellet fertilizer with insects and birds, how would people re um, receive your response? Would it be through an email? I will get that to Sue and Sue, can you get them the answers? Absolutely, yes. And uh, we will also send out uh, the recording for the presentation. And while I'm on, I, I do wanna say, I know that there are several folks uh, here on the Zoom meeting that are not from Colorado. And I would say to them that all of your county uh, counties have extension services and also a master gardening program. So that, um, uh, you know, some things could, could be answered by the Colorado folks, but your local county extension services have master gardeners and volunteer programs and answers for you as well. Thank you, Sue. And I am And I'm just going through here some fun container ideas. And yes, Jennifer. Oh, I was gonna say, I'm gonna post in the question and answers, the local phone number for Garfield Extension Office. Great. I'm gonna go back, whoops, I am going to go back to this one for a minute. Notice that's being grown in um, a piece of furniture. So, yes, it goes up. These guys in the drawers, they've either got, they've got some way to drain and not get the rot the drawer out. Just remember you need drainage is my point. Just some fun ways that you can grow things. These are just cans. This one's a good one because it doesn't have any drainage. Um, it's solid on the bottom. So they're growing things that are very low water use and don't need to be watered often. And you'd have to make sure that the soil was completely dry before you watered it again. Yes, Jennifer. Oh, I am, I am sending the phone number, but I think you should repeat the number again also live. Sure. The number of the extension is 970-625. 3969 and you want extension 2. Thank you. And we also have a question. Sure. We have a question from Frank. Tomato plants and pots have curling leaves. Hmm, what's the plant? Tomato. It's probably um, watering. You're either watering in inconsistent watering. So you're watering too often and then not often enough. It could be because we've had a lot of wind lately, simply from the wind. If you call the extension office, they can send someone out, a master gardener out to take a look at the actual tomato plants and help get you a better answer on that. And all of that's free, by the way. So don't hesitate to call because it's not gonna cost you anything. And maybe the master gardener, if they come out can help you with other things too. Notice these have excellent drainage. So you probably don't want them in your kitchen unless it's over a sink. <laughs> Any other questions? No. Then I thank you all for attending. And do please contact us if you have questions in the future or if something comes up when you look back through the presentation. And back to Sue, I guess. Yeah, well, well, Debbie and Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, this is a fantastic wrap up for our series. And um, we will make sure that everybody that wants it gets the video. Uh, and um, it's been terrific. Thank you so much for, for your effort. I know it was not, it was a big deal. Thank, thank you very much.
thank you guys. And we very much appreciate you attending. Back to Alex, I guess. Thank you, everybody. I just want to say, uh, say good night. The video will be recorded um, and will be posted to the library's Facebook as of tomorrow. Um, so you can find it there. Everybody okay. Have a good night. Good Thank night. you so much. Good night. Good night.